was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. And for today's Daily Dose of Stupid, y'all, I don't know how many more reports I'll have to do on this for the next coming months and, and quite arguably another four years. Trump derangement syndrome, 100% real. And it is a heck of a disease. It spreads much like the coronavirus, sometimes without people even realizing that they are sick when they're carrying it around. Um, but here's the thing. Normally, when we talk about Trump derangement C syndrome, TDS, as it's been come to, to be known, usually we're talking about Democrats. That's what, you know, is kind of par for the course. It doesn't just affect Democrats. It really affects anybody that, A, hates President Trump, and B, allows that hatred to cloud their judgment and cloud their rational thinking. And unfortunately, this does happen to more than just people that are Democrats. So um, to provide a little bit of context to the audience, if you haven't been a long-term fan of mine, if you weren't paying attention to my show in the 2014, 2015, 2016 years, one thing that you probably don't realize about me, unless I've mentioned it sort of looking back, is that I was never a big Trump fan. In fact, I was a member of the Never Trump movement. Now, when the man took office, I did what I thought was the fair thing, and I said, from this point on, I will only judge his conduct as president as what has happened since he's been in the White House. I will only judge his job as president based on this day forward, which, by the way, was a standard I applied to President Obama. I thought that was fair. Now, the difference is President Obama proved very quickly that he was exactly what we thought he was before he got elected, but nonetheless, with President Trump, there were a lot of things I was wrong on. A lot of things I was right on, too. But mostly, I was wrong. A lot of my fears about him not being a conservative, about him kowtowing to the Democrats and governing far more liberally than any of his Republican colleagues that were running against him in that primary, turned out to be completely wrong. Now, I still think that there were better options in that primary, and I still think that given the information that I had at the time, I probably made the right decision, and my skepticism was not unfounded. But at the same time, I'm not too big to admit, I was incorrect. But unfortunately, some people in the Never Trump movement that were there with me back then, I don't you know, think of these specific people as allies, and one I'll, I'll get to in a second, but some of them never were able to let that grudge go. And I think that it's really sad because you're even hearing some of these people that are suffering from Trump derangement syndrome in the never Trump camp that were back there then, they've been provided with lots of new information and have yet to change their mind. Now, I'm not saying that a person, uh, that it is inconscionable for a person to even consider voting against President Trump. I don't play that game. Frankly, I haven't 100% decided that I'm going to vote for him this time either. I always reserve judgment for every race until right up before it happens. And that's part of the reason I delay telling people who I'm going to vote for until right up before the election. And that's something I stand by. I haven't 100% made up my mind that I am going to vote for President Trump this time. There's a lot of time between now and then, and something could happen. But what I don't want to become, and that I'm at least glad that I never did become, were people that are so blinded by that dislike of President Trump. There's days where I really don't like him either. There's days where I really like him. But I've never let my original dislike for the president keep myself from admitting that he could ever do anything good or to be able to objectively look at something that he's done versus something that another politician either has done or would have done in his position. So I want to draw your attention, that being said, to a couple of tweets here that I think are suffering from the Trump derangement syndrome that are not actually Democrats. So this one is from Bill Kristol. For those of you who don't know Bill Kristol, he was with uh, a long-standing conservative news magazine for a very long time. It's out of business now, but uh, he ran that for a long time. And so here's Bill Kristol's tweet. Uh, oh, sorry, that's, uh, that's Joe Walsh. Well, you know, we'll just read Joe Walsh's first then. 
so this is Joe Walsh, who recently dropped out of the presidential race. He was actually running against President Trump. He was trying to be a primary uh, opponent of his. So Bill Cr- or Joe Walsh says, one, Donald Trump is a unique and dangerous threat to our republic. He must be stopped. All of us must come together to stop him. Therefore, I pledge to support whoever the Democrat nominee is. And then if, you, if a libertarian slash conservative like me can make that pledge, can't you? Now, there's a couple things I want you to take away from this. First of all, if you are a conservative libertarian, I do not understand how on earth you can make the statement that you pledge your support to whomever the Democrats nominate. Even if you had the full field that was there at the beginning, I still couldn't see that. But especially now when you've got it narrowed down to a communist in his 80s, a full-blown communist that honeymooned in the Soviet Union that believes in nationalizing all the banks, nationalizing health care, and his slightly less radical but pretty much exactly the same counterpart, Pocahontas herself. And then you've also got Joe Biden, who for the longest time was the most radical senator on the left, all about some government control, all about government spending, uh, you could go through Pete Buttigieg, who wants full-on socialized medicine. Now, his wouldn't destroy all of private health care, but it would, it would destroy most of it, and it would basically socialize medicine for the United States. It would take us more to something like Canada has, where they have a private health care sector for the, the uber-rich, but pretty much everybody just falls back on the government system. Uh, there's nobody in that field that even remotely comes close to being as near a libertarian or a conservative as Donald Trump. Now, don't get me wrong. Donald Trump is not really a conservative slash libertarian candidate, and that's one of the reasons that I didn't vote for him in 2016. He's got some authoritarian tendencies that kind of spook me. And even though I thought that it was going to be a lot worse than it was, because he's actually not governed all that authoritarianly, he does have the rhetoric of an authoritarian. But he's drastically slashed things like regulation. The economy has been operating in a more free market mode than it has really in years. He's not been one that has been all in favor of a whole bunch of regulation or government oversight or bailing a bunch of companies out. Now, the one economic policy where Trump is not very libertarian is on tariffs, and I agree that he's horrible on that. And his default seems to be to be in favor of tariffs, but the Democrats, though they might not necessarily be in favor of that, They are in favor of all the other economic controls, so I don't see how anybody gets to the point to where, oh, well, Trump's not even close to a libertarian or a conservative, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to vote for the least libertarian, least conservative person that I can. I'm sorry, that that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And here's this next graphic uh, from Bill Kristol, who ran a conservative magazine for it. Now, he's really more establishment GOP And that's the reason that he doesn't really like Trump. So very different motivation from Joe Walsh. But he says, not presumably forever, not perhaps for a day after November 3rd, 2020, the day after Election Day, not on every issue or in every way until then, but for the time being, one has to say, we are all Democrats now. And so Bill Kristol, more of the establishment Republicans that really don't like Trump because he's not one of their guys. He's not one of the big business, uh, chamber of crony capitalism, uh, all about some government bailouts, interventionalist when it comes to warfare. That's what he doesn't like about Trump. Now, Joe Walsh, at least if we're believing what he says he believes in, if we're taking him at face value, says that he's very libertarian. So, The exact opposite, he doesn't like Trump because he's not conservative enough, not because he's not establishment enough like Bill Kristol. But these are two examples of people that have allowed their own personal animus towards the president that they had back then when he was kind of an unknown carry over 
into long after the president has done overall a fairly good job. He's been very good for the pro-life cause, at least as good as somebody that doesn't have Congress really backing him on that can be. He's not been great at cut, cutting spending. He's kind of just given a blank check to Congress and he keeps signing these omnibus bills that continue to increase spending. But at least his proposed budgets that he said he would like to sign if they wound up on his desk have included significant cuts. He's been very good for the military. He's been excellent, excellent at cutting regulation. That's the thing that I think he gets an A-plus on. And you look at the two Supreme Court justices he's nominated. Kavanaugh is much more of a loose cannon, and we're not real sure where he is. I think that he's, based on everything that I've seen, more conservative than Roberts, at least, which is, you know, moving the court at least slightly in the right direction, considering Kennedy was slightly left of Roberts. And then Gorsuch, who, by every indication that we've gotten so far, is the second coming of Antonin Scalia. Are you really so blinded by your dislike of the man that you are incapable of admitting, admitting when he does something right or when he does something praiseworthy? That you have this animus that you're saying, I'll vote for anybody other than him, even if that person espouses my values to a lesser extent than President Trump just because they're not Trump. That's a completely childish, irrational thing to do. Now, here's the thing. When it all comes down to it, I don't like the false dichotomies. I don't like the, the tribalist rhetoric. I never bought into and still do not buy into the idea that, well, you have to vote for this person or this person. It's a, a choice between two people and you have to pick the lesser of two evils. I don't like that argument. I never have. I think that if you capitulate to voting for the lesser of two evils, you're still voting for evil. And so I've never bought into that argument. But what I don't understand even more, what I think is even more absurd and illogical than the lesser of two evils doctrine is this doctrine. Because it's almost like they're advocating voting for the greater of two evils. That doesn't make any sense. Now, I didn't vote for President Trump in 2016 because I did not feel that he was sufficiently conservative enough. But I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. That would be even worse. That would be voting for the greater of two evils. It doesn't make any sense. And I think that what this does, I think that really what it all boils down to is, yeah, Trump is not only incredibly imperfect, but he's not really somebody that fits into that libertarian slash conservative mindset. He's not an ideologue. He doesn't do everything that we would like him to do. And, and I'm not trying to make excuses for him when he screws up or does something that doesn't make sense. I call him out on it. I've always done that. But if that's where you're coming from and you're looking at him and because you're upset that he's not that, you're willing to vote for somebody that's even less of that, then you, by your own definition, are not really a conservative slash libertarian. Because you're, you're voting for something that is as far in the opposite that you possibly can. There is nothing further opposite of libertarianism or conservatism than somebody that is a full-on self-proclaimed socialist that wants to nationalize all of our major industries and provide universal health care, universal education. There's nothing more anti-libertarian than that. There's nothing more anti-small government than that. And that leaves us with only one conclusion. This particular person, both Joe Walsh and Bill Crystal, for different reasons, but ultimately arriving at the same conclusion, their Trump derangement syndrome is so rabid, and they hate the man so much, they are willing to jettison all of their rational thought in order to do anything they can to hurt him. And that doesn't make any sense, but ultimately that's what hatred is. See, the reason hatred is so deadly, the reason that it is so poisonous, is because ultimately it blinds you, it clouds your judgment, and it causes you to do things that violate your own principles and your own standards. And yeah, that's true in politics, but what I also want you to remember is that this is an example of what personal hatred can do in your life. 
It can cause you to do things that hurt yourself just to spite the other person. And that's why I say conclusively, even though I, I rarely do this with anybody, left or right, political, non-political, whatever, I rarely say it's obvious to me that this person, person A, hates person B. But I'm looking at the data here, I'm, I'm looking at the evidence that has put it before me in these tweets, and I can't think of any other logical explanation for why somebody would intentionally do something that is in contradiction to their own beliefs that would harm them just in order to stick it to somebody else. Frankly, hatred is the only logical explanation for why someone would be willing to do that. And that is why, even though I think that it bears a, there's a moral to the story here and there's a lesson to be learned in the political realm. More importantly, this should be a frightening testament to what hatred can do in your life personally as well. My mother always said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.